It is impossible to imagine what fighting in combat is like unless we have actually done that. Two more of our country's heroes are with us today to share their experiences fighting in seven, that is seven, different conflicts from Vietnam to Iraq and Afghanistan. Jim Lawrence is a retired Marine captain. He's also a retired naval aviator, rank of commander. And he is a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel. Only he can explain all of that. He has over 35,000 flight hours, 7,700 in single-seat aircraft, three combat tours flying over Laos, North and South Vietnam, then Bosnia and Afghanistan. His first carrier landing, or trap as naval aviators call it, was flying the Navy T-2B jet trainer at age 19. Among his aircraft, the Navy F-8 Crusader, the A-4 Skyhawk, and the O-1 Bird Dog, all in combat before he turned 22. Then came the A-7 Corsair and the A-10 Warthog over Bosnia, and the King Air 350 over Afghanistan. He retired from Western and Delta as a captain after 35 years with the airlines. Michael Durant is a retired Chief Warrant Officer 4 Army Aviator. Over 22 years active duty, he flew 150 medevac missions in the UH-1 Huey and UH-60 helicopters. Then air assault missions assigned to the 101st Aviation Battalion at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. He participated in combat operation Prime Chance to protect American flagged oil tankers in the Persian Gulf. Operation Just Cause, the U.S. invasion of Panama, and Operation Desert Storm, where he was the first helicopter pilot to engage a Scud missile launcher. Flying with the 160th Special Operations Regiment, SOAR, on October 3rd, 1993, he was the second Black Hawk helicopter to crash in Mogadishu, Somalia, where he was seriously injured and taken prisoner. He was released after 11 days in captivity. His three crewmates and two army snipers were killed trying to fight off hostile Somalis. Durant retired with 3,700 flight hours, 1,400 of those hours on night goggles. He wrote a New York Times bestseller in the Company of Heroes about his career and his experiences in Somalia. In 2008, Durant was inducted into the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. Both gentlemen are highly decorated. Jim Lawrence, Distinguished Flying Cross, 36 Air Medals, two single mission medals, and many, many more. Michael Durant, Distinguished Flying Cross with Oak Leaf Cluster, Bronze Star with V Device, the Purple Heart, three Air Medals, the POW Medal, and many, many more. Thank you all very much. Please welcome Jim Lawrence and Michael Durant. Jim. Sir. Oh, God, don't call me sir. Darn. Uh, you, you just heard it. Um, you're a Marine. And I'd heard, you know, once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. But you retired from the Marines and became a Naval officer and aviator. And then you retired from Marine Corps and became an Air Force pilot. Now, what was this all about? Jim. I just couldn't keep a steady job. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, he missed Army aviation. I mean, are you, how hurt are your it, feelings? It's not over yet. I mean, <laughs> maybe he's saving the best for last. <laughs> right. Jim, start us off, would you? Um, in all your flying, start with, what, the A-4 uh, in Vietnam. Yes, sir. Uh, we had... Uh, when I got my wings, uh, we went overseas, uh, deployed to uh, Chu Lai, uh, Vietnam, and I was assigned, I was a young lieutenant, uh, 21 years old, and I uh, was assigned to VMA 211 out of Chu Lai and was flying combat missions there, and then they asked for volunteers to go to the uh, bird dog as a FAC, and being 21, I figured you know, what could possibly go wrong, and uh, 
So I volunteered to uh, go be a fac. So that's how. So you went from flying A4 at four or five hundred miles an hour to flying a bird dog at what ninety miles an hour? Oh, on a good day. <laughs> on a good day. So what does that really say about you? I mean, that I'm a really slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the bird dog missions. Uh, the bird dog mission was probably one of the more rewarding because we were working with our ground troops uh, in in heavy contact as. As you know, Michael certainly understands. And our mission in the bird dog was uh, to find the bad guys, uh, well, depending on which side you're on, and uh, which was usually not very difficult. And we would work with our ground troops. Uh, we would then identify the targets, uh, bring in fighters. Uh, because we were fighter pilots, we knew the capabilities of the aircraft. We knew the uh, ordnance because we had been doing it and uh, uh, I love it anyway uh, then we would control the tactical fighters we controlled F4 Phantoms uh, A4 Skyhawks F100s and uh, we controlled naval gunfire off of the battleship New Jersey I controlled her about a dozen times in the Newport News uh, cruiser and then Marine and Army Artillery. So, how, um, how often were you shot at? I mean, how, how dangerous is that flying at that altitude? So well, it got pretty sporting every now and then, but uh, probably, I would say, 90% of our missions, we took ground fire. In fact, the names on the side of my airplane are my squadron mates who were shot down and killed in action while we were flying the bird dog, uh, we could only fly it for six months because the loss rate was so high. Yeah. Um, so that's as memorial to my buddies that didn't come home. Yeah. Michael, helicopters, of course, since Vietnam. Uh, how significant since Vietnam especially um, have helicopters become? Well, I think, you know, I, I haven't served in Afghanistan or Iraq in these recent conflicts, but w what I understand about the utilization of, of helicopters in general is they're almost the jeeps of the modern battlefield. I mean, you're moving stuff, you're hauling troops, they're just, there's so many things that you can do with them, and it's, you know, when there's a, an IED threat, which there is on the ground, obviously... It's often considered a safer way to move people and equipment and things around. Now, who would ever thought we'd get to the point where we think flying helicopters around is safer than riding on roads? But, but it is, and uh, I think if you took helicopters away from the commanders on the battlefield today, you'd, you'd really limit their ability to do what they need to do. Now, you're Huey flying in medevac. What, where were your medevac missions, and how dangerous were they? Well, I, I, I've always said that being assigned to medevac as my first assignment out of flight school was the greatest thing that could have happened, although it didn't feel that way at the time. You know, a lot of what ends up in our lives, happening in our lives is luck and chance and good fortune. Uh, so I didn't really want to go do that, but uh, that was the assignment. And when I got there, I realized it was a fantastic assignment because in medevac, uh, well, I had to progress to pilot and command status pretty fast. I did it like in three months. Uh, if I had gone to a, what we would call a lift battalion or, or a utility battalion, uh, I probably wouldn't have been pushed that fast forward because when you're in medevac, you're flying by yourself all the time. And, and although it's not combat, it's usually a real world mission. So there are potentially lives on the line. So there's a lot of decision making, a lot of autonomy. And for a new pilot, you know, that's the kind of stuff you got to get exposed to because you start to learn. I mean, you're going to make mistakes and that's how you learn. You learn from making them. How did you come to helicopters as opposed to wanting to fly fixed wing or something else? Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's the first aircraft that I really got to go spend any time in was a helicopter. And I just thought that it was the, the I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I was 14 years old. I'll never forget that first flight. And, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking, what am I going to do in my life? Uh, am I going to go, you know, work in the mill? I come from a mill town. Uh, nothing against it, but, is, you know, is, is that my career aspiration? Or do I want to do what this guy's doing over here that seems to be having a blast and, and he's getting paid to do it, you know? So uh, from that moment on, I really set, the, you know, set the, that as my target. And where were you flying medevac missions? In Korea. I sp I sp the, my medevac assignment was uh, in Korea. And I enjoyed it so much, I extended. Normally, you were there for a year, but I extended and spent 20 months there. And what were your experiences there? Uh, 
challenging but very rewarding. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty difficult terrain for helicopters. A lot of mountains, a lot of wires. Seoul's a big city, you got the DMZ, you know, so there's a lot of things that you're dealing with there uh, and don't have a lot of time to plan. You know, it's a medevac mission, so the phone rings, you got to go and you're out the door. Um, so as I said, it's a really good place to develop those decision-making skills and, and aviation skills. Physically, when the bell rings, as you just suggested, how long does it take to f get a helicopter off the ground? What's the process of of being able to actually fly. How long does it take? I mean, you can start it in about three minutes if you really want to. Now, that's, oddly enough, legacy aircraft are easier to start than current generation aircraft because in some of the newer aircraft, you got to get things spun up and let, get alignments to occur, you know, with the navigation systems and all that. But in, in these older aircraft, push the button, advance the throttles, and go. You know, doesn't mean you haven't done all the procedures you're supposed to do, but you do those ahead of time. Right. So you can get the aircraft off the ground in just a few minutes. So Jim, um, Bosnia, the A-10. So you've already flown a bunch of airplanes and you move into the A-10. Describe what it's like to fly that airplane and why is it effective? Now the A-10 is, is truly amazing uh, airplane in its own self. It's the premier close air support aircraft. But let me just regress for a second and say something about the dust off uh, Army medic medevac guys. When I was flying the bird dog and flying the A-4 in Vietnam, the Army dust off uh, medevac uh, helicopter guys were some of the absolute bravest most amazing guys that I have ever supported and watched in action. These guys would go in and pull out our wounded, uh, Marines or Army, it didn't matter. But when Dustoff got the call, they went in and they did it. And it was just utterly amazing, Michael, what you guys did. And well, those, those were my predecessors, but it, it sort of set the culture for, for medevac and certainly all Army aviation. Absolutely. The dust-off guys, well, there's children and ladies here, but they carried certain parts of their anatomy around in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> I might add that um, the last few years, uh, retired Army, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, Army General Pat Brady, uh, Medal of Honor recipient, and Pat was supposed to have been with us today, but his wife has some health issues. But our hope is that General Brady will be back with us next year. Um, yeah, I'm sorry now, back to your original question yeah, <laughs> about yeah, the A-10. Uh, the A-10 is a very unique aircraft. If you listen to any of the grunts, uh, grunts being infantry guys on the ground, they, they love the A-10. It can carry a lot of ordnance and it can stay on station a long time. It can put pressure on the target over and over again. And then with the 30 millimeter cannon uh, that fires 70 rounds a second, we carried 1,142 bullets. And uh, it is just the premier close air support aircraft. I know they're trying to replace it with the F-35, but it's just not the same. Yeah, what's your view of that? And it's in the media all the time about those who want to keep the airplane and those who want to get rid of it. Well, those that want to keep the airplane know what they're doing. And the, um, you talk to the infantry guys, and the only airplane, not, not to say that the F-16 and the F-18 aren't great airplanes, because they are. I mean, they're fantastic airplanes in their own, in their own way. But the A-10, the Warthog, is a, a unique aircraft specifically designed for close air support. And it can stay longer, carry more. So it's just, they're making a big mistake. Uh, the airplane has been upgraded in the cockpit to what's called a Charlie model. Uh, it's got a glass cockpit now, it's got a lightning pod so that you can designate your uh, smart weapons on your own rather than have another aircraft do it for you. But it's just, uh, it, needs to, it, needs to be, it needs to be there. So your early missions in Bosnia, tell us about the beginning for you of A-10 flying in Bosnia. Well, when we first got there, uh, it was Operation uh, Deny Flight. So we were flying patrols over Bosnia, uh, just basically every day. We'd fly uh, every day over Bosnia, uh, working with the uh, ground troops from all over the world. And then when, we, uh, when the Serbs bombed and shelled Sarajevo Marketplace in August of 95, that's when NATO finally got the courage to do something and we turned into uh, Operation uh, Deliberate Force, which we then 
started flying airstrikes uh, against the Serbs, and it was really interesting. I led one of our first uh, our first strike uh, that morning in August, and we took off at two o'clock in the morning after about 30 minutes of sleep, and uh, found our tankers uh, in a pitch black night. Uh, nothing like the sound around. Uh, found our tankers and then we went into our orbit points off of uh, Croatia and about that time Magic, who was the AWACS aircraft, called me, my call sign was Mako 27, said Mako 27 go green and I went green which is secure radio and they said uh, you're authorized weapons free which meant we were, going, we were going to war basically is what it meant and uh, of course, I authenticated them just to make sure that it wasn't somebody trying to fool us. And then I came back onto our tactical frequency and I told our, our flight, I said, proceed you to targets as brief, you know, God be with us. And off we went. How often were you shot at? What happened that day when the, that first mission? Well, that was a pretty interesting morning. My target was uh, the largest armored repair facility in all of the Balkans uh, near uh, Sarajevo in a town called Hidichi. And my wingman, Dan Peabody, uh, he was an attorney, so we called him counselor. <laughs> so counselor and I proceeded over to the target. I checked in with the French Foreign Legion, uh, Disney 6, who was the guys on the ground. And Disney authenticated me, and I authenticated him. And I, it was a clear day. I had the target. And I rolled in on the target, and from about 28,000, and so I was it's still using, dark. Or are you in daytime now? It was daytime. It was uh, right at dawn, actually. It was just after dawn, and I rolled in. I locked up the uh, Tread Assembly Building, which was my target, and just as I started to squeeze the Maverick off, and the Maverick, for those of you who don't know, we had a, it's a uh, infrared guided uh, missile. We could uh, flip a switch on. Uh, the inboard throttle of the A-10 and you'd get a, a video picture would come up and you saw what the missile saw. So you could then slew and lock onto your target, which I did, and I'm just getting ready to release and counselor starts yelling at me, Nomad, Nomad, Sam, Sam, break, break. And Dan had never seen a real Sam. He, he didn't have any combat time, so normally when you tell somebody that, you tell them which way to break, but Dan was a little bit tense at that point and so it was just an instantaneous decision for me and I broke hard right and uh, fortunately it was the right way and I picked up the missile as it was coming up and uh, I was able to defeat that missile and then before the morning was over I had uh, had six SAMs fired at me and four anti-aircraft sites. Three of the anti-aircraft sites were silenced by British artillery off of Mount Igman and then I took on this one anti-aircraft site that was out of their range, and uh, it was like the gunfight at the OK Corral. It was, I had tracers going by my canopy and uh, flak going off, and, and I turned my gun on, and uh, I started engaging him from about 9,000 feet away, and fortunately, uh, I hit him before he hit me, and then I decided, you know, to get the hell out of town. <laughs> How many more missions did you fly in the Warthog? Uh, in Bosnia, I flew another 42 missions. Right. Michael Mokadishu, what were we doing there? Mission. So initially, it was actually a humanitarian relief operation. The Somali what year, people what were, year was this, sorry? What uh, year? In 92, we entered Somalia, just before Christmas of 92. And it was really just provide security for relief organizations. I was not personally involved at that point. And then over about a six-month period, the mission started to expand in scope and uh, essentially became a manhunt. And that's when we got involved because that's kind of one of the missions that we usually take on within the special operations world. So our, our rehearsals and our focus was on being able to go into the city and capture, as it turned out, a list of 50 individuals that the UN wanted apprehended. What is the crew of, now this is your helicopter, right? Or an updated version of it. it? Yeah, it's not mine, but... Well. <laughs> but I, I, I do have one, but it's not a mic model. <laughs> <laughs> but the Black Hawk, how yeah. many on the crew and... Um, uh, typically in the Army, it's a crew of four. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Uh, I mean, you can just fly with two pilots if you want to. But typically, for tactical missions, a crew of four, two pilots, two crew chiefs. So what happened that day? 
So it's the seventh mission that day you're referring to, I'm assuming, is Black Hawk Down, October 3rd, 93. Right. Uh, the, uh, the mission that day is to go capture two top 10 personnel. We'd already captured the number two guy and we'd captured 25 others. So we had 26 already in prison uh, in a six week period. So it had gone pretty well. We hadn't lost any people and lost, hadn't lost any aircraft. But this particular day we knew was gonna be different. Uh, there was four things about it. One, worst part of town. If you put a pin on the map, the place you do not want to go in Mogadishu, that's where the mission was. Number two is daytime, so we can't use our night vision technology and we can't really hide as well, obviously, in the dark. Number three, we've done it six times before, so they, they're starting to learn what our tactics are and they're doing things to be more effective against that. And the last one is you can't land Blackhawks in the street. This part of the city, the streets are too narrow. So it's okay going in because we can fast rope people in. means you throw ropes out the side and they slide down the ropes. Easy, in fast, it's probably better than, than landing. The issue comes with extraction. So we, we can't air land the Blackhawks, which means we've either got to get everybody off rooftops, which is not a good idea because rooftop extraction, you've been on the target now for probably a half an hour, attracting a lot of attention. You come in and land on the roof, I mean, you think about it, it's kind of hard to articulate here, but, you know, picture a helicopter up over the top of that screen. Anybody in this whole area can shoot at it, whereas if you land it in here, you have the natural cover of the buildings around you. So you, if you want, in an urban environment, if you can air land, you want to do it. So we decided we're not going to extract with helicopters. We're going to extract with ground vehicles, which was the right answer. So we go in, the mission's going okay. Couple little things happened. We did have a Ranger fall from an aircraft, which, you know, to most people wouldn't be a little thing, but, you know, in the conduct of an operation like that, you know, you just fix the problem and move on. Uh, about 40 minutes in, we lose our first aircraft, and uh, it was Super 6 1. And how many aircraft were there? There were over 20 on the mission, oh. yeah, and plus about four fixed wing assets overhead. So, I mean, it's, these are pretty complicated little missions. Uh, the, uh, the first Blackhawk is shot down, and what they're doing is they're orbiting the target, uh, not a 30 millimeter gun, but a gun with a high rate of fire, is 7.62, but we could shoot 4,000 rounds a minute with it. So much more firepower than the troops on the ground have on their own. It's why they love close air support and why they like helo support, because you know we can bring some real firepower to the, to the fight. So he's in tight, circling the target, and gets shot down by an RPG. So a few other things happened. We had a search and rescue bird get shot down. It went in to try to help that down crew. They get hit by an RPG. So that's when I got called in uh, to replace that first aircraft. So when you, when you get called in to replace somebody who just got shot down, I mean, that's, it's not gonna be a good day. You know? And we knew that going in, but we also know the guys on the ground, they need the support. They're, they're being pummeled and they're surrounded and they're not gonna get out of there if we don't help them suppress uh, the enemy fire. So we roll in, we made it around about three times when uh, we got hit by an RPG. And the RPG hit, uh, that's the tail rotor on the back there, the nose, if you're not familiar with helicopters, is this pointy end over here on the left. The, the, the tail rotor keeps you from spinning. The RPG hit just underneath that big round gearbox casing that you can see right there, and it essentially blew everything off from that point up. The tail rotor left the aircraft completely, which in a Blackhawk is not a good thing. Uh, we were at low altitude, low airspeed, spun violently, uh, the only thing you can do in that situation is shut the engines off, which is not something you really want to do either. But you have to to get control of the aircraft. So we did. Ray Frank, my co-pilot, actually did it because a Blackhawk, if you get up close enough to see, the engine control levers are up overhead. They're not on the controls. So I'm flying. He's getting the engines off. And somewhere during that process, we hit the ground. And... Uh, the only thing I'm trying to do is keep from flipping upside down, which I was able to do somehow. And we hit on the gear, which is the only reason I'm still here. And, uh, and you mentioned, you know, dust off pilots from Vietnam. Not only, you know, did they set the culture for Army aviation, them and, and you know, all helo pilots in that war, but there's so many lessons learned from a technology perspective that if you parked the Huey here and you went side by side, you could talk about, you know, Blackhawk's got two engines. Blackhawk's got redundant flight controls. It's got redundant electrical systems, hydraulic systems. It's got self-sealing fuel lines. All of that stuff came out of lessons learned from Vietnam 
things that you know would have saved lives had they been in place then that are in these airframes today part of why I'm here and it all works exactly as advertised so when you hit how many there were four of you on board at the time yes so when you hit who was injured? Anyone? Oh, we were all injured very bad, yeah. I broke my, uh, you know, even though those landing gear will strut or, or uh, attenuate the crash, and the seat does the same thing. It has shock absorbers on it. Uh, we hit so hard that my right femur actually snapped off on the seat, just the pure G-forces of the impact. And then my vertebrae were crushed in my spine. Not, not the discs, but the actual bones themselves smashed into each other and one compressed 30%, so the compression fracture is. So uh, I, I had pretty serious injuries and then uh, obviously was unconscious for probably five minutes. Um, were you, how quickly were you surrounded? Well, onesie twosie Somalis started coming in right away, but uh, two Delta Force uh, commandos, Randy Sugart and Gary Gordon, were overhead and they saw that something had to be done or we're gonna be lost. And they volunteered to go in and I, you know, I, I don't think you can ever fully appreciate the significance of that act. You looking down, I often ask myself, if I was in their shoes, would I have done that? You know, it's hard to, you don't know, there's no way to know. But they did, and not only did they volunteer, but they were told no initially. And then finally, one of them got on the radio directly to the command center and said, if you don't let us go in, these guys are gone. And they were given permission, they dropped off, and they came up alongside. How did, how did they get down? Super 6-2, another Blackhawk, got as close as they could, and, uh, and Gary and Randy uh, maneuvered on the ground to finally get to our Did side. they rope down? Or I think they jumped. I think they were able to get down to about eight feet, and they jumped out. Right. Now, they came to your protection, right? Right. And what happened then? So... They, they arrived on the side of the aircraft and I knew them, uh, so I'm thinking somehow there's a rescue force here, this is over. Uh, not knowing, it's just two guys and that's, the, the next reinforcements don't get there for eight hours. So we, we were on our own for the long haul, didn't know it. So I'm optimistic at this point, but um, we fought uh, the enemy off for I'd say maybe 15 minutes. Gary Gordon goes down first. Um, Randy then comes back around, and I think at that point, it's just me and Randy. I don't think anybody else has left. I've shot all my ammunition. He gives me Gary's weapon. He grabs the crew chief's weapons from the aircraft and goes back around, makes his last stand. Uh, they estimate, you know, th there's hundreds of Somalis here, so it's a matter of seconds before he, he just can't hold them all off. So he's killed, and then they overrun the site. Um, initially, pretty certain they're gonna kill me because they're all out of control, angry and violent and there's nothing you can do. I mean, you can't run, you can't hide, got no ammunition left. Um, so I basically accepted my fate. So they descended on me and started to uh, beat me to death. I mean, they broke my nose, my cheekbone, my eye socket. They uh, were ripping all my gear off. Uh, and I had been to survival school. It's one thing, another lesson learned from Vietnam. We didn't historically send the Army aviators or ground force to survival school prior to deploying to combat. But post-Vietnam, all of our special forces, of which I technically was qualified as, got, went to survival school. So I went to survival school where they teach you as much as they can what you're supposed to do in these situations. And they basically tell you, you know, make the best of it. Don't make it any worse than it already is. So I essentially did my best to just roll with the punches and, and, and uh, not uh, antagonize them anymore. They realized I had value as a prisoner, stopped the, the madness, fired shots in the air, got control of the mob, and uh, brought me into captivity. And what happened in captivity? Well, it's no picnic either. You know, they teach us in survival school, it doesn't matter how hungry, tired, thirsty you are, evasion is way better than captivity. And it is. Uh, but uh, it, captivity is better than death, I guess. So uh, they, uh, I was shot in captivity on the next day. Uh, they didn't care about my injuries. They were throwing me around like, a, like a, you know, no litter, nothing, just throwing me in cars. My femur went out the backside of my leg at some point in that process. Um, they did a ver video interrogation, which most people recognize when they see it, uh, aired on, uh, on international television. But over time, Doing some of the things they taught me in survival school, 
they began to be more, uh, I don't want to say kind, but not as hostile. And, and it got to the point where I don't think, even if their orders were to kill me in the event of a rescue attempt, I'm not sure they would have because they, they just kind of got to know me, you know, and, and uh, developed uh, almost a, a relationship with me because, I mean, you spend 11 days with somebody 24-7, you, they, I guess they become human to you if they weren't in the beginning. What, to what extent do you think they were already in the process of negotiating or trying to take advantage of the fact that you were captured? Well, I don't really think they had a plan. It didn't seem like they had a plan initially. It seemed somewhat chaotic. Uh, and then when they made the video and it aired, obviously everybody knew that I was in captivity. But then the president sent the former ambassador, a gentleman named Robert Oakley, who the Somalis really... President of the United States. The president of the U.S. sent Robert Oakley to Somalia. And the Somalis really liked Robert Oakley. I've always said, if we had a thousand Robert Oakleys out there in the world, we wouldn't have half the trouble we have. Because he was a great statesman. He was a straight shooter. They trusted him. And he met with them and he said, you got two choices. And I, I heard him tell this story to me more than once. He said, I told him you could keep him in captivity or you can let him go. If you keep him, sooner or later we're going to figure out where he is and we're going to come rescue him. And when we do, we're coming with everything we got. And there was, you know, AC-130s and fighters and carrier battle group all had brought, been brought in to put this bonfire out now. And uh, he had credibility, so when he said that, the Somalis said, I think the best course of action is let him go. And within 48 hours, they let me go. Wow. <laughs> Thanks. And I don't know if we're going to circle back, um, but Randy Sugart and Gary Gordon were posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor, and I just want to make sure that gets into the conversation. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that goes back to what you described about the decision that they made in, you know, countering their commanders and said, no, we're going, we're going. You know, Jim, back to you in Afghanistan. We've I mean, covered from Vietnam to Afghanistan. Uh, what was your mission over Afghanistan? What were you flying? Uh, well, at that point in time, I was already retired from the military, and I got a phone call one day, and they asked me if I would be willing to volunteer to go fly uh, MC-12Rs, which is uh, your King Air 350 turboprop, and uh, fly reconnaissance. And... Uh, I was actually attached to the 101st Airborne, so I actually did make it to the Army. <laughs> <laughs> I told <laughs> but, you. <laughs> yeah, I'd say the best was last. Made your day, right? Yeah, that was it. And, uh, but our mission was uh, uh, highly classified, obviously. Um, most of the time I worked with a, uh, a SEAL or a Delta Force uh, working all the equipment in the back. That was uh, very sensitive. And... Uh, our mission was to uh, recon and basically identify and locate guys that were being sought after. And uh, we pretty well covered all of Afghanistan. Um, my last 10 missions there was all up on the uh, northern border, northeastern border in the Hakeen area, which is a very bad area. All of Afghanistan was a bad area. And my last 10 missions, like I said, were there. And the data that we were gathering was being sent. And when I got home, about two weeks after I got home, they announced that they had taken out uh, 24 of the top Taliban leaders. And it was exactly where I was. Well, so but that was it, it was reconnaissance. You know, going back to Vietnam, when you were flying those missions uh, in the bird dog, I mentioned in the film Laos and Cambodia, but we weren't in Laos and Cambodia, were we? No, sir. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, looking back over your military career, what are your reflections? I think the, uh, the people that you work with, I, you know, if th you're not going to hear a different answer from anybody that's ever been in uniform. Yeah, they're great machines and it's a great mission and... You know, there's a lot of elements to it that, that you have fond memories of, but it's, it's the people, no question. Jim? 
totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, the one thing I think I miss the most, and Michael's probably share this, is uh, I miss the camaraderie of the squadron and the guys that you fly side by side with. You know, they're like your brothers. And by the way, after we finish our part of the program here and in a few minutes with a walk around the, uh, the airplanes, uh, Michael's going to be in the bookstore uh, to sign copies of his In the Company of Heroes book. So he'll be there just a little bit later. Uh, questions from the floor? Questions? Anybody? Thinking? Anybody? Got there we go. Question? Yes, sir. I can hear it. He's asking about what, what about the movie, Black Hawk Down? Uh, most common question, by the way, if no one was going to ask a question, that, that's the one I would throw out. I, I, I say it's accurate enough. It's not perfect. Uh, but if you watch the movie, it gives you a good sense of what actually happened. Um, the, the biggest deviation is the combined characters. So sometimes you'll see one character in the movie doing something. That actually happened, but it was actually that guy over there. And the reason they do that is they can't develop 25 characters in a feature film. They got to focus on a handful. So they take the, the actions of several and put them into one person. And that person becomes a superhero and everybody else is, you know, honorable mention. But that's, that's just the way the movie making business is. Yeah. Any other questions? Questions, questions. Yeah, we got one. Good. What were your, Jim, what were your dates in 2011? Uh, I was there from uh, June of uh, 1968, and I rotated home in uh, September of 69. Any other questions? Um, Sam Bass, our colleague here. Ah, we got one over here. Uh, we'll get it. No matter if you could go back and change anything, would you? What would you change if you could go back and change anything in your career? One of the, uh, and it's a very long story that I won't bore you with, but one of the names on the side of that airplane is Lieutenant Jim Reese, who was a very dear friend of mine. And he was uh, a hooch mate. Uh, his bunk was next to mine. And Jim <coughs> had a few libations uh, the night before. And uh, anyway, long story short, uh, I, volunt I went down to Ops and said, I'd like, you know, I want to take Reese's mission and he can fly mine later. And uh, I was just getting up when Jim woke up and he said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm gonna fly your mission. You go ahead and get some sleep. I said, the weather's really lousy anyway. And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll get my, uh, you know, I'll fly my mission. And I said, well, you dummy, just go back to sleep. I've already got it all set up. And well, anyway, he got up and got dressed. I said, well, I'd at least have breakfast with you. And I went down and had breakfast with him. And uh, I was scheduled to relieve him a little later. Anyway, long story short, uh, I took off early to try and relieve him, and uh, I couldn't find him, and uh, he had been uh, uh, shot down and uh, killed, and I guess probably out of my entire career, I wish that I had tried harder not to get him to... Well fly that mission. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Michael, any thoughts on the same subject? Well, you know, if, if, if you're talking about things you can control, I would say no. If you're talking about things you can't control, then obviously I would change the fact that, you know, some folks didn't come home. That would be the thing that I would change. But I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. It, yeah. it, it's amazing stuff. And, uh, changed who I am and uh, I, I would absolutely unhesitatingly do it all again. Yeah, I agree with that. I'd, I'd go back right now. <laughs> you know, if there's any spirit 
and there are many spirits here at EAA, this seems to be the predominant one of people who have decided it's important to use their lives to protect our freedoms, make our country better, and like you just heard, they would go back and do it again. So, gentlemen, thank you both very much. Thank you, Dave. And now, Sam Bass with Paul Wood, who owns this A4, and Jim and Michael are going to talk about their aircraft as well. So we can start out with Jim. Jim, let's start with your airplane, because this is the furthest one away. And uh, just tell me a little bit about the specs on the airplane. Well, the uh, Bird Dog, uh, it's uh, obviously a reconnaissance aircraft. It's slowed. It's very slow. <laughs> uh, but it uh, has a 213 horsepower Continental engine in it. It uh, has about, uh, on a good day, about four and a half hours endurance. Uh, it's unarmed, although we carried uh, Willie Pete rockets uh, to mark our targets with. And actually uh, flew with the uh, windows open uh, so we could hear them shooting at us. And then I'd shoot back with an AK-47 and then throw hand grenades out the window at them, which surprised a lot of North Vietnamese. <laughs> And uh, it's a good solid airplane. It uh, flies well once you get it in the air. The biggest boo-boo about this airplane, or the biggest challenge about this airplane, is, uh, is landing it. Um, it only weighs about 2,400 pounds gross weight. And uh, it, uh, so it sometimes can kind of get away from you. And uh, it uh, has a history of being ground loopable, which means the airplane kind of turns around on you. And... Uh, that's about uh, that's about it. It's uh, it's a very dependable airplane. The only crews about it, you know, if you see 120, uh, that's a good day. <laughs> and uh, other than that, lands about 70 miles an hour, takes off at about 50. And uh, other than that, that's uh, that's a bird dog. Well, you mentioned that uh, you had our six months tour because there were so many losses. How many airplanes did you? You, do you figure you look lost in the Vietnamese or South War in Southeast Asia? Our, our squadron alone lost uh, six aircraft, six bird dogs. And there's almost 500 total lost. I total think. over 500, uh, counting the Air Force and the uh, Army um, bird dogs. Okay, now you mentioned the the hard points on there. That you really didn't, have, other than the AK-47, that was the only thing you had that you could shoot back with, right? That was it. Yes, sir. Now, that were they? They kind of reluctant to shoot shoot at you because they knew that if they you saw where they were shooting, you were going to sick the big boys in on them, right? Yes, sir. They knew that we had friends in high places, and uh, <laughs> they would uh, only open up on us, like you said, if they knew that we had spotted them, and then they'd do everything they could to bring us down. Now, you didn't fly into Ravens, but you had some interconnection with the Ravens. Could you Absolutely. just talk a little bit about that? I, what they yeah, did the Ravens it? were an amazing bunch of guys. They were on the Air Force called the Steve Canyon Program, and it was all, you know, super secret in Laos, and uh, I had a couple we, of really good we buddies. We weren't in Laos, were we? Uh, no, sir, we weren't. At, uh, I had a couple of good buddies that were Ravens, and when I was flying the A-4, uh, I flew a number of missions uh, over there where the Ravens were our uh, control our facts. Okay, now the significance of your paint scheme on here. Uh, this aircraft is identical to the one that I flew in Vietnam. It's in the uh, same markings as my squadron, VMO-6, Marine Observation Squadron 6. Um, and 41 is actually the tail number of one of the airplanes that, that I actually flew. And it kind of corresponds, uh, our call sign was fingerprint, and uh, I was fingerprint 41. Well, let me ask you this, of course, you, you've got all this vast experience in, in the different services. What does it mean to you when you fly this airplane to these air shows and the veterans come up and they look at this thing and they're very nostalgic about it? They, it, it, it is a wonderful thing to see the veterans come up and they say, you know what, this airplane saved my bacon. And either that or uh, well, I have young people come up um, that want to know, well, what did you do with this airplane? And they don't really understand. But it, it still is a reminder of the sacrifices that were made. And I think that's important. Like Paul has the A-4 and, and Michael has the Blackhawk and the Bird Dog and all of the warbirds that are here that, you know, it's just uh, freedom ain't free, folks. And uh, I don't care what anybody says. You know, it's a 
price that has to be paid, and a lot of people are forgetting that. Well, thank you for the, for your information on this one here, and this is this is Paul's airplane here, and this is Paul Wood, and, and Paul is the founder of the War Warbird Heritage Foundation in Waukegan, Wisconsin. He flies the F eighty six, the A four, L thirty nine, and a T two Buckeye of jets. He flies some other airplanes also, and this is his airplane. And I'd I'd like for both of you to stand here. Jim over here also, because we talk about Jim flying it in combat. And tell us a little bit about your airplanes for the specifications on it. Well, sure. Uh, the Douglas uh, A-4 was originally designed to take over the duties of the uh, Douglas A-1 Sky Raider, which was a carrier-based ground attack airplane. And uh, the designer of the airplane was a guy by the name of Ed Heineman. And uh, so his idea was to design a very light, very nimble uh, airplane that could be launched off carriers and have a predominant role in ground attack and drop bombs and fire rockets on ground attack targets. And uh, it ended up being a phenomenal airplane. It had lots of nicknames, the Bantam Bomber, uh, the Scooter, and Heinemann's Hot Rod. And it's a testament to the maneuverability of the airplane that, that uh, um, it got all these nicknames, I think. It uh, is supposed to have dropped more bombs in North Vietnam than any Navy carrier-based airplane in the course of the war. Is that yeah, right? That's true. Yeah. So. And I also understand that there was only one of these that was lost in air-to-air conquer. Isn't that correct? During the Vietnam War? Well, they lost, they lost a lot of them. I think they lost 350 or 60 of them. Yeah, and, but I think that was the only one that was ground fire. Yeah, yeah, it was all ground fire. Okay. Now, how many of these were built? Uh, just under 3,000, I think, 200 or 2,962. Yeah. <laughs> well, how many? How many are you still flying now? Uh, in civilian hands, there are uh, two single seaters, uh, and then there, I think, are four TA fours in civilian hands. Then there are some government contractors that have uh, A fours that are still doing red air support out of Nellis or uh, training JTACs and things like that. But they're on DoD contracts. So civilian owners, there's only just a handful. Now this is in Navy livery, but it, the Marines also flew this airplane, right? Correct. Yeah, they did. So I, now how many? How many of the? How many? Of the, Squadrons did you have of Marines? Do you remember? Uh, the Marine Corps had uh, about uh, Probably at the time probably ten squadrons Okay, how about the arm mode on it? Well, it had uh, I think three hard points, but you could probably tell a little bit more about the armaments I think than I could well the uh, the Charlie model and the Bravo models had three hard points on it the echo model that I flew in Vietnam had five and most of the time depending on the missions we were fragged for you'd carry 500 pound bombs which could either be a uh, snake eye which is a retard bomb that gives you time to get separation from the explosion it's delivered at a very high rate of speed at a very low altitude much more precise than dropping dumb bomb it's a dumb bomb right or you'd fly the 500 pounders with a slicks or we'd carry zuni rockets or napalm and we had the 20 millimeter cannons. And it would, it would carry almost half the load of the B-17 would in the second world war it actually carry more, more than the B-17 yeah. More than a B-17. Yeah, it'd carry about twice but, as much as a B-17. Okay, good. So that, I had heard that before, but somebody said half, and I thought, well, that, that's a little strange. No, it was about twice the amount. <laughs> now, now, tell me about, the, this could be used also for a tanker, and it's kind of amazing that a little, a little airplane like this right. can be a tanker. Yeah, I think they uh, they put a buddy store on the center line uh, pylon, right? And yeah. so uh, if they needed a tank, they could send someone up with, uh, I don't know how large the tank was. Uh, about, 370, about 375 gallons, and it had a drogue system, which is, you know, how the Navy Marines, we refueled with the, uh, like the probe there. Right. And, yeah, we had uh, uh, tankers that would... Uh, you know, go up and refuel birds coming back. Most of the time in Vietnam, we had KC-130s uh, as tanker aircraft that we go plug into. All right, Paul, now, this, this is in the Navy livery. Tell me the significance of this, this particular paint scheme in uh, Lieutenant Schwartz's name is on the sure, side. Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, as we talked about earlier, the A-4 was a ground attack airplane, and it was never really originally designed for any air-to-air -air combat, although in later versions they used a lot uh, the A-4 is a lot in air-to-air. -air. Um, but at the time, uh, Lieutenant Commander T.R. Schwartz was flying off the Bonhomme Richard, uh, and he was in Yankee Station, and he was uh, 
uh, what uh, part of it was called an Iron Hand mission, which was flak suppression in front of a ma major strike. And uh, he was loaded up with uh, five-inch Zuni rockets under the rails. And uh, interestingly, he had no 20 millimeter ammunition because he was restricted on weight. So his job was to go in and find flak sites, roll in on them, take the flak sites out ahead of the main strike force, and then come back home. And he didn't have any bullets because he wanted to save weight for takeoff. Uh, so he was rolling in on his first flak site, and his wingman said, hey, TR, you got MiGs left 7 o'clock. And so he rolled off uh, his target and came around behind the MiGs and fired off all his 5-inch Zuni unguided rockets and shot down a MiG. And so he's credited with the only air-to-air -air kill by an A-4 in all of Vietnam. And so so, so yeah. we put, I mean, it was just, uh, these are dumb rockets that just, you know, go like that. They're meant to be unguided air-to-ground, and he actually got lucky and hit one. And so he's got the... He's got the only kill air-to-air -air in right. Vietnam. So that's what, we're honoring him with his paint scheme. What, let me ask, I'll ask you the same question I asked Jim. What does it mean to you to bring this airplane to these air shows and let these veterans see this airplane? And may, many times it's the first time they've seen it since they've, sure. you know, they, they're, they're out of combat. Yeah, well, uh, our museum has about 12 airplanes right now, the A-4 being one of them. And our whole objective is to fly these airplanes and take them to air shows so that people uh, who it maybe did not serve in the military can see, not only see them, but hear them and smell them and see the smoke and hear the sounds and watch how fast they are and that sort of thing. And it's just our way of honoring the veterans who served and the heroes, both men and women in the military that flew and maintained these things to just keep our country free. And I think that's, that's something that I want to do and all the people affiliated with our museum want to do. Uh, and we're very active about it. And uh, it's a way to pay tribute to these great heroes. So, Well, Jim, we really, we really uh, <laughs> Jim, Paul, we really appreciate what you're doing to, for the Warburg community here. And we really appreciate you bringing your airplane it's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Now Thanks. let's go over there and talk to Michael and let Michael tell us about this helicopter, which I don't know anything at all about. <laughs> Michael, tell us a little bit about the specifications and what this, what, what was it designed for originally? So, a lot of memories with this airplane. It should be on. Still on? Okay. Yeah, okay. So this is, this, this particular Blackhawk is a UH-60 Mike model, which is the newest one that the Army has fielded. The original Blackhawk, which goes back to the late 70s, was actually uh, developed to replace the Huey. Now, I know a lot of us uh, have a close relationship with the Huey, and rightfully so. It's an iconic aircraft. But... Uh, it's been around for a while, and the Blackhawk replaced it in the Army for the uh, assault and general utility role. That's what the UH stands for. Okay, and, and you said it, they took a lot of lessons from Vietnam about redundancy and, and that sort of thing. Is that correct? Absolutely. Can you, can you get into that just a little bit? Sure. So uh, you, can, you can see from, from where you, you sit that... There's two engines, so that's the first difference. There are two twin-engine Hueys, but most of them out there in the world are single engines, so that's obviously uh, an improvement. This thing's got, uh, as I mentioned earlier, two hydraulic systems. It's got uh, two electrical systems. It's got... Um, the crash attenuation of the landing gear, if I could remember my operator's manual, I would know exactly the feet per second that this will attenuate, but I don't remember. Uh, but you can hit pretty hard, and, and the, the landing gear will absorb the impact. It has self-sealing fuel lines. Uh, one, of, one of the major contributors to loss of life in the Vietnam era design was post-crash fires. You got people who are hurt, they can't get out of the bird, and the aircraft catches on fire. These aircraft are designed, the fuel lines break away, there's no fuel fuel spillage. So when I regain consciousness, it's like somebody shut the aircraft down because the fuel lines all broke off, but the fuel didn't leak anywhere. So uh, save my that one feature saved my life right there. So all those things come out of uh, lessons learned. You got ballistic fuel tanks in this aircraft. Uh, what else you got? Obviously, you know, some of the more recent design changes. This particular version has a digital moving map. It has integrated communications, uh, some additional things that are more... Um, uh, I would say enhancements for the 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 task of flying the thing, not moving the sticks, but getting where you need to go. Uh, but in terms of the real kind of nuts and bolts, big improvements, I think that I hit the highlights. It obviously has it's faster, carries more weight. Uh, what's the max sling on these now? Eight thousand or ten thousand? Nine 
Nine, 9,000. So you put 9,000 pounds on the hook. A Huey, I think, was four. Um, so, you know, huge improvements there. And that's all driven by ground force requirements. You know, when the Huey was flying, you're hauling a Jeep around. With this thing, you're hauling a Humvee around, which is pushing eight grand with right. stuff in it. So you, you, you've got to, you got to, you know, in, in improve your air capability to support changes that occur with the ground force. Now, what kind of armor do you have on this thing? So the normal Blackhawk, Again, it was designed as a utility helicopter, right. but it is a multi-role helicopter if you want to use it that way. So uh, an assault Blackhawk will have door guns mounted here that the crew chief or door gunner will utilize during infiltrations and exfiltrations or whenever other times are needed. I had a very good fortune to be in special operations uh, where we had the latitude to do some other stuff. So going all the way back to the late 80s, we armed ours into an attack helicopter configuration. So we, we, uh, we modified the minigun mounts to where they were fixed forward. So we end up with a, a gun that is pointing forward basically right here, one on each side, and each of those fires up to 4,000 rounds of 7.62. We put 30 millimeters on wings. These, these hard points here, you can mount wings. Uh, we put the same gun that's on the Apache. The Apache has a nose 30 millimeter. Right. We put 30 millimeters on the wings. The beauty of this is we could put two of them. So we had, we could put a 30 on each side and the same magazine that the Apache has inside feeding them. Uh, I don't remember, I think it's 1,100 rounds per magazine. Not as big as that A10 30 millimeter. That 30 millimeter and an A10 is a giant round but the ballistically it's a 30 millimeter round. We also put Hellfire missiles on it. So you could put, if you wanted to, 16 Hellfire missiles on this thing. Uh, in fact, I personally fired the first Hellfire off of Blackhawk out of Nevada uh, back in the late 80s. Um, again, it's, it, there's just so many things you can do with it. We put rocket pods on it. Rocket pods have 19 shots each. You got four stations, so you're talking four 19 shot rocket pods if you want to, or any of those combinations in between. Usually we would go, 30 on one side, uh, rocket pot on the other side, and then the two miniguns fixed forward for attack helicopter configuration. Now, when you went on a mission, how long, how long would you be up? So the other thing that we did is added internal auxiliary tanks. So this aircraft's probably got about two hours and 20 minutes of endurance at normal operating speed and weight. We put a whole nother set of fuel tanks inside to basically double that. So we could go four hours and 20 if we wanted to. We actually had a configuration where there were six of them in there and you could fly up to uh, maybe eight, nine hours without refueling. But that's all you're doing is hauling gas at that point. You're not hauling anything now else. With, with all of these guns and, and the rockets that you had on there and the special forces, did you were you firing all the guns, or did you have somebody or the other, the co-pilot or whatever? No, we're and firing you flew them all. It from the right side, didn't you? Either right one. Seat? You could sit left seat or right seat. Yeah. So we're, we're doing we're we're doing the flying and the shooting. Okay. And then the other thing you're talking about fuel. Um, we put refuel probes on the front of ours. Uh, you know, it's not. It looks just like that on the end, but it's much bigger and longer because we got to get out beyond the radius of these rotor blades. So in a Blackhawk, the refuel probe actually extends. It sits in a fixed position where it's probably about, I don't know, four or six feet sticking out. And then when it's ready, when you're ready to use it, it extends another, I don't know, probably six feet to get out near the end of the rotor blades. And then we follow C-130s because... With the Drogan probe? Correct. Because only the C-130 is slow enough to get to speed where we can keep up with it. You can't do it off a, like a KC-135 or a, or a KC-10. And I imagine with the weather bad, that's kind of dicey, isn't it? It's, it's actually diciest on a nice sunny afternoon because what happens on nice sunny afternoons out there in, in airspace? Turbulence. Yeah. And you're trying to, to get in tight with this drogue that's doing this. It actually has to come in under the rotor blade tips. So you're trying to, and you can't just sneak up on it. You gotta, you gotta strike it. Right. And uh, on those sunny afternoons when it's really bumpy, it's very difficult to do it. It's a lot easier at night or, you know, or when the weather's uh, a little more stable. Is there anything else you'd like to add on this? Means I don't know anything about helicopters. <laughs> well. Uh, I, you know, I think the folks that fly it are going to tell you this is the greatest helicopter ever been built. I mean, it, it's these things have been around for 30 years now. They're probably going to be around for 30 more. Uh, it is an absolutely fantastic machine. It was designed right in the beginning. We've made you know incremental improvements all the way that keep making this thing better. Guys that fly the Mike model, I'm sure would tell you, uh, you know, it's got some great enhancements that they they really like over the earlier versions of the aircraft, and. Uh, 
it's highly reliable. In the times that I was uh, operational, I can think of maybe only two times when I went out there to launch and was not able to take off because of an aircraft malfunction. So, fantastic machine. Michael, thank you. I admire you greatly. We're talking about Black Hawk helicopters. A lot of people have been requesting for this video, honestly, along with the Huey helicopter, which, yes, I will be doing a review on in the future also. We all know of the Black Hawk helicopter. It has been around for a long time. It is featured in some fairly, you know, prominent movies, including, obviously, Black Hawk Down, which is literally one of my favorite war movies, and some of you will probably be in the comments section screaming at your keyboards telling me that it's the worst movie ever or whatever else you want to say or maybe you agree with me but the helicopter itself is still an iconic piece of American aviation and today I would really like to thank everyone who has served on it because this is quite a prominent aircraft for both medevac and Kazivac. and I know for myself I have known people who have been injured or um, you know have unfortunately been lost in service being recovered by these aircraft in Afghanistan so to those who have served on them or continue to serve on them thank you so much so we are talking about the UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter, which is a medium utility helicopter used for a wide variety of applications, including troop transport and medical evacuations. Since its introduction in 1979, the UH-60 has distinguished itself as being one of the great one-size-fits-all medium lift helicopters, with its distribution reaching to almost every corner of the world. Sikorsky built the UH-60 Black Hawk to withstand brutal ground fire while keeping passengers and crew safe. According to the US Army, the Black Hawk was developed due to the Army's requirement in 1972 for a simple, robust and reliable utility helicopter system to satisfy projected air mobile requirements around the world. The helicopter is named after Black Hawk, a war chief and leader of the Sauk tribe in Midwestern United States. Black Hawk was an ally for the British Army during the War of 1812 and fought against the US Army to push settlers away from his people in the Sauk territory. The Sikorsky UH-60 Black Hawk has become a workhorse for the United States and other military forces the world over. Its capabilities have increased her roles to include special operations assignments, assault, medivac, command and control, and VIP transport duty on top of her inherent troop transport normal capabilities. This includes delivering the President of the United States. The first production Black Hawk entered service in 1979 and remains a primary fixture for many of even any army today, two decades after its inception. Some 2,600 total Blackhawks have been delivered worldwide. The UH-60 Blackhawk is designed to endure the most extreme conditions and provides enhanced security for military operations. According to Sikorsky, safety features of the Blackhawk include ballistically tolerant rotor and drive systems, high mass components retained high crash conditioning, a anti-plow keel beam, reduced rollover potential with CEFS installed, energy absorbing landing gear up to 300 feet per second, Crashworthy fuel cells of 65 foot drops, jettisonable cockpit doors and pop out windows, along with wire strike protection. The Black Hawk was born out of the Sikorsky S 70 project designed by the United States Army Utility Tactical Transport Aircraft System, or UTAS, which was a specification that began in the latter part of the 1960s. The specification itself originated on the data collected from wartime use of the UH 1 Huey Iroquois helicopters pulling multiple duties across the war zone. Review of this experience brought about the need for a capable replacement system for the immediate future. 
This design specification also coincided with the development of the new General Electric turboshaft engine series designated as the T700. US Army feelers went out in 1972 with both Sikorsky and Boeing Vitol both answering the call. The Sikorsky design was chosen ahead of Boeing Vitol, the YUH-61 Alpha attempt, and the Sikorsky YUH-60 Alpha prototype, which achieved first flight on November 29, 1974. The production contract was handed to Sikorsky in late 1976, with first deliveries of the Blackhawk system beginning two years later. The Blackhawk was officially introduced into service in the middle of 1979 with the US Army 101st Airborne Division, replacing the vulnerable UH-1 Hueys. Blackhawks have a distinct look about them, making them highly recognisable even when compared to her contemporaries. The forward portion of the fuselage contains seating positions for the pilot and co-pilot, collectively known as the flight crew, with windowed panels above, forward, below and to the sides. Each crew position is afforded an entry-exit door, directly behind the cockpit though is the cabin that allows for the seating of some 11 personnel, depending on the specific variant or version that has been given. It also has entry-exit doors made by two double-windowed sliding doors along the side of the aircraft. The General Electric Series turboshaft engines sit atop either side of the middle fuselage with a four-blade main rotor extending up between them. The undercarriage is completely fixed and features two main landing gears forward and a single tail wheel fitted on the fuselage area between the cabin and the extreme edge of the tail. Blackhawks have participated in pretty much all frontline conflicts spanning from Grenada to Afghanistan. They are even used in search and rescue helicopters in both commercial and military settings. Conventional versions of the UH-60 Blackhawk can transport up to 11 troops or carry 2,600 pounds of cargo internally. When equipped with a load sling, the UH-60 can lift and transport up to 9,000 pounds from the ground. Initial requirements for the UH-60 Blackhawk aircraft include a modular design for easier repairs, high life cycle, and parts for fewer replacements, a troop transport and medical evacuation capability. It has since gone on to serve a number of different capacities though, including humanitarian aid and special operations insertion and extraction. A highly modified version of the UH-60 was even used in the acclaimed raid on Osama Bin Laden's compound in 2011. The surviving tail rudder of the MH-60s indicated specialized stealth technology was used in its construction and electronic warfare modules were added to help evade Pakistani radar contact. Several versions of the UH-60 Blackhawk are available for export from the United States. Foreign buyers are able to purchase specially designed versions for everything from commercial to the use of counterinsurgency or coin operations. Two ESSS or external store support systems can be equipped with air to surface missiles, electronic warfare pods or even extra fuel storage. When configured for extra fuel, the UH-60 Blackhawk can fly up to 1,381 miles before even needing to refuel. Some models even have a refueling nozzle to allow it to have an in-flight refueling. Because this medium lift helicopter has been in service since 1979, it has undergone some really big upgrades beginning in 1986. The improved UH-60L includes a hover IR suppression system, or HERS, meant to mask or reduce the amount of heat kicking out of the engine. In December 2007, the United States Army ordered a new low rate initial production, or LRIP, upgrade to turn the UH-60Ls into the UH-60Ms. In total, Sikorsky, under the contract to deliver 950 UH-60M aircraft, are to be delivered by 2025. This newest design feature is even more robust, with more efficient rotors and better infrared suppression. The infrared suppression is important for evading detection of surface-to-air missiles. The crew of the UH-60 generally consists of the two pilots, a crew chief and door gunners. The door gunner and the crew chief may be positioned on either side of the UH-60 and may be equipped with anything ranging from the M240G to an advanced General Electric M134 7.62mm 6 barrel minigun, depending upon the mission requirements of course. The cargo bay of the UH-60 may be equipped to carry up to the 11 combat troops fully configured in their infantry setup, or can be reconfigured to carry advanced electronic warfare equipment or even medical litters, basically stretchers. With a reinforced bottom to help deflect anti-aircraft fire and titanium cord rotors to protect against flak and ground fire, the UH-60 is an ideal helicopter to move troops in and out of highly contested areas. Few helicopters are built to endure every possible situation that may arise, however the UH-60 is definitely one of these, boasting a massive variety of features on the UH-60 base variant alone, let alone the vast array of variants that are created for special operations, pure transport, electronic warfare or many other duties. Boasting an aerodynamic design overall and high top speed, the UH-60 has an amazing survivability rate. The aircraft is able to deter most modern threats today and even survive direct hits from ground fire. 
The UH-60 really does remain one of the backbones of US Army aviation squadrons and can often be seen in photographs flying in tight formations everywhere from Iraq to Afghanistan and beyond. Even the multiple variants of the Black Hawk are widely renowned for their efficiency despite being modified from a utilitarian design. There is also the S-70 Alpha Black Hawk helicopter, which is flown by a crew of three, the pilot, the co-pilot and the deck crew of one in the back of the cabin. The S-70 Alpha helicopter is equipped with a glass cockpit and digital avionics. In addition, S-70 customers may select a Digital Automated Flight Computer System, or AFCS, to simply give the workload to the pilot less and less. An electronic flight information system provides primary pilotage and navigation displays for aircrew. The S-70 Alpha also has some interesting weapons. It's qualified as a launch platform for the laser-guided Hellfire anti-armor missile. The Black Hawk can also carry 16 Hellfire missiles using external store supplies, and has a capacity of carrying 10,000 pounds worth of missiles, rockets, cannons, electronic countermeasure pods, or whatever else you want to accommodate on the side of it. The S-70 can also carry two 50 caliber machine guns in the windows or parallel to the aircraft to fire at the ground. The US Army Blackhawks are normally fitted with the Goodrick AN-AVR 2B laser threat warning systems. But, of course, all good things do come to an end, and as many of you who are watching this video are probably aware, the UH-60 is going to be replaced soon. The US Army has picked two winners which will face off to replace the UH-60 Blackhawk medium transport helicopter. The Sikorsky Boeing SB-1 Defiant will square off against the Bell Textron V-280 Valor in the future long-range assault aircraft program. The winner will enter the US Army service with the first units equipped with the aircraft in 2030. The Black Hawk helicopter truly has been a proven, reliable aircraft for almost 40 years, and the design has been maxed out though. The Army wants faster, longer range replacements, and the service made clear that it had to have the achievement of being fast, revolutionary, and very good at vertical lift. The two competing aircraft reflect the Army's desire for new technology. It's a sad thing to hear knowing that such a legacy helicopter is going to be taken out of service, but I can safely say that no matter what replaces it, it will probably still stay in service for many, many years to come elsewhere around the world. When we look at this helicopter, I always think of the US military. You know, I know it's used around the world, but it is a staple workhorse of the US Army for sure. Of course, you know, the Navy also use it in its own configuration and cross with, you know, other cores of the uh, military around the world. And I really do think it's just such an amazing piece of equipment. Uh, the fact that it can be so modular, updated and upgraded to meet just about any challenge that whatever military is using it puts it up against is really, really impressive. Um, I've never flew on a uh, Black Hawk before. I would love to. I've been on the Chinook, I've been on the Lynx, I've been on a Gazelle, uh, but not a Black Hawk. But as I did say before, this is a massive shout out and this video is dedicated to those who have supported, operated, flew these aircraft. Um, really though, it does mean a lot to me knowing that you guys serve across these aircraft because they have done such amazing things around the world, uh, saving lives, uh, protecting those who need it, uh, medivacking and kazivacking out those who are in you know, danger, whether it be military members or civilian casualties. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has served on these aircraft. Mm -hmm.